hold hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to the Ghost Story Guys. Hello, this is Luke Lore, a companion piece to the Ghost Story Guys podcast, where I share some of the folklore surrounding the stories the main episodes tell. I'm doing something a little different this time in more ways than one. Uh, first up, topic. I had a Patreon request I do Ouija boards and tarot cards. For this episode, I'm going all in on Ouija boards, which do crop up on a semi-regular basis across various episodes. But this doesn't have a specific episode to reference, not yet anyway. As for method, this is going to be quite a broad theory-based loop lore after a little bit of history. More a reflection of what goes on inside my head than direct research I've dug up. It's going to make this a little different, so I'm extra interested in any feedback after this one. Ouija boards have been around for quite a long while now, a lot longer if you count anything similar from before it getting the Ouija board name. Its best known form got debuted in 1890 and really took off some time later thanks to a William Fold. The Fold family had what I've seen referred to as a Ouija board empire, filling a whole load of patents related to them. Uh, random fun number fact. If you're numerologically inclined, the most popular design, the iconic letter and number layout that we all know add to love and or fear, is design patent number 114,534, which was filed on May 2nd, 1939. No idea if there's any extraordinary significance to those numbers, but the devil on my shoulder is whispering that I should be including them in scripts somewhere to see what happens. Uh, important side note, I'm not a good role model when it comes to the supernatural. The whole who owns the Ouija board thing seems to be a very typical USA legal thing, wherein William Fold did not seem to actually invent them and just scream the loudest about how it was theirs in court. At the very least, William Fold's employer was making them before he took over. I'm seeing mentions of various spirit boards, talking boards, and planchette-based medium techniques from all over the place, really. Medieval Europe, Classical Roman Greece, Dynastic China. It really is all over the place worldwide, and regularly banned, make of that what you will. Back to modern times though, after three generations of this full Ouija board empire, the toy patent, as that's essentially what it was, finally ended up at Hasbro. Fun Hasbro fact, recommended for players over the age of eight. I'm in two minds if this is solid proof it is just a toy, or if the inherent malevolence of the all-consuming Hasbro Mega Corporation is in fact proof of evil at work. The board itself has some relatively innocuous psychological basis into how it potentially works, with a lot of mundane research pointed towards the idiomotor effect, allowing people to subconsciously operate the planchette with micro-movements. Even before a certain movie, as a believer there will be plenty of different theories as to what this parlour trick could be up to. But, enter certain movie, and that movie was The Exorcist. The Exorcist really does have a lot to answer for when it comes to current perceptions of what was essentially a toy for the longest time. Make no mistake that Christians have always hated the things, and I can find earlier films making use of a Ouija board with such as The Uninvited being from 1944, but The Exorcist is the big one here. While it's taken for granted now as a foundation within pop culture, The Exorcist was a breakout horror movie which terrorised a mainstream audience that really wasn't ready for it, before going on to fight its way to Ad Academy Award success. It left a hell of a dent on our cultural consciousness, and the aforementioned Christian hate was probably just low-level hatred of all things vaguely witchcraft until The Exorcist happened. The Exorcist left an indelible mark on all things spirit board, though. These things became the paranormal equivalent of radioactive, very handled with care, when at points in the past they have been packaged as novelties with blissfully unaware children frolicking on the bloody packaging. Even something as notorious as Zozo the Ouija board demon seems to be a derivative of Pazuzu from the film, the ancient demon god that makes for the malevolent force and antagonist of the story. Zozo remains pretty creepy though, despite questionable origins followed by it spreading via creepypasta. In what seems to be an Amterville horror-style hysteria whipped up to sell a book, Darren Evans started talking up demonic curses surrounding an entity calling itself Zozo he claims he reached for a Ouija board. Seeing things, terrifying things, massive bad luck befalling his family, and scratches all over his body for good measure. Ghost Adventures swooped in on this for some demon-based hype, taking Evans back to the original place they claimed to summon Zozu in the first place, giving mainstream attention to a story spreading by itself pretty well online. 
Evans, for his part, is very vocal about calling Ouija boards portals to evil forces. Here's the worrying thing to watch out for if you're using a Ouija board. First up, any encounter where something identifies itself as Zozo. This is an obvious red flag. Best case scenario is something is having to play at being Zozo the Ouija demon, and it's well worth noping out of there. Something else to watch out for, apparently, is an out-of-control planchette moving in figure-eight motions, threatening to carry on out of the bounds of the board. Pressing for a name result in Zozo revealing itself, and stories go that letting the planchette escape off the board is what Zozo is trying to do to escape out into the location they were contacted. At that point, telling Zozo politely, not today, and burning sage every damn where is recommended. So there's the basics. Proto Ouija boards have been forms of divination, or sometimes necromancy, across the years up to the spiritualist movement. It was a parlour trick for a while before becoming a toy, which it technically still is as Hasbro owns it, alongside My Little Pony and other such demonic paraphernalia. From there, pop culture happened with the exorcist pushing them clean into the evil box, and Zozo infecting the internet 2009 ish with the help of Ghost Adventures to really push it. Planchette based boards have centuries of history behind them without a Hellgate exploding civilization, though, and there's even some solid research into a psychological explanation, yet it still remains that people have bad experiences with these boards. If you're 100% a believer, there's always a chance that this is one of those old timey toys that fail health and safety regulations on a spiritual level, instead of having your eye out, it'll have your soul out. It won't be the first dumb thing marketed as a toy, and it probably won't be the last either. Can't help but be fascinated thinking what else might be going on here, and looking at the whole thing with an investigative eye, so here's where the Luke Law format goes a little experimental. The way I see it, there are three broad approaches to investigating Ouija boards, and trying to explain what's going on here with such varied results. Approach 1. Suggestibility. It is just a parlour trick. This is the full sceptic view. It's a magician's trick, a mix of subconscious movements and suggestibility, which does have some party pooper scientific background thanks to idiomotor research. This is the least interesting, and in some cases most disappointing alternative, but I will urge people not to discount how impressively powerful the human mind is. In this way a group can, with no direct collaboration, create an interactive entity based on environmental cues and shared imagination. Another way to think of this, and the problem with this, is how unhelpful it is to tell someone with audible hallucinations to just ignore it because it isn't real. They will know this, but that doesn't change the fact that their subjective reality includes extra noises if not full on voices. It's still happening to them, whether an external force is yelling at them, or it's a part of their mind turning against them. A part of your own mind turning against you is not a concept lacking in terror if you think it through. Collectively creating an imaginary enemy out to get you with a Ouija board is still a worrying scenario, even if it doesn't have a convenient spirit to blame. In some ways, it's a lot worse. Approach 2. Intentionality. The person using the implement determines the usage. So it doesn't matter that it was a toy as the expectation it's going to work will create the result. In the same way, any stick can be a dowsing rod if you're good enough at dowsing, any collection of letters and improvised planchette can be a conduit to spirits if you apply yourself. This has a worrying overlap with the suggestibility theory, given that pop culture has warped the idea of what a spirit board is. Give it to a serious practitioner packing some wards and cleansing materials, you have another tool in the practitioner's toolkit. Give it to dumb kids afraid a demon will see it as a dinner bell, and that irresistible belief in the back of their minds a dinner bell shall make. Approach 3. Availability. Kind of like intentionality, except via external forces. Since you've got them put it there, something will use that tool. This covers everything from the broad idea you ask the universe a question you'll get an answer, to evil forces using it as a lever to crack your soul open because you were dumb enough to invite it in. The yin to the yang scale there is pretty extreme, which is probably why believers yell at people for messing with Ouija boards. This is very similar to the intentionality theory, given that they're both the paranormal explanations, but it's much more about the where as well as factors like the when over the who. To contact a spirit with a Ouija board, you put it where the spirit is likely to be, at a good time for it. Put the board down where there's an evil spirit to use it, you're in trouble. No matter what you intend, the tool is not in your hands, but instead of the hands of something other, and in this way, a harmless game with no ill intent, can still become dial a demon if there's a demon around to use it. 
So there you have it. A little history and a lot of hypothesizing from me. The three approaches are much more my personal theories on potential subjects over my usual observe and report style. So I do want to hear what listeners think here. These three broad areas are pretty much how I approach all stories I look into. They can roughly be broken down to, is it the mind? Is it magic? Is it monsters? A massive oversimplification, but I find that kind of catchy. I may someday cough up a book called Mind Magic Monsters to really ramble on this at length. Until then, you can request more subjects to be tackled like this, or yell at me to stick to just the stories at our email, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. And I am Luke Greensmith on both Twitter and Facebook. There's always the Instagram too, but I don't quite know how that thing works beyond forwarding fun things I found online to be passed on to the followers there. Anything Luke Law that pops up on there will eventually get back to me though, so fill your boots if Instagram is your thing. I also especially pay attention to Patreon comments on Luke Law episodes, as its topic shows. Not only that, but followers on Patreon get this early, so check out patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys, as well as for all the other cool rewards if you want to support us directly. But as ever, just listening is always plenty of support in and of itself, and we thank you for that. The tarot card request has not been forgotten, and all requests will be filed away for later. Anything difficult or obscure will be taken as a challenge, and I will get around to them eventually. Next month, being all festive with the holidays, should be a lovely Yule-themed Luke lore as I share some Krampus folklore. Goodbye for now. <laughs> <laughs>